We are here today at the top of the University of Glasgow Tower on the eve of our graduation where over the last four years we've learnt about the physical and human processes that affect the planet. Through studying earth science it's become clear to me that Scotland and the landscape that we've both grown up in is being drastically altered due to climate change. And as a geographer what fascinates me is how people and social systems can be vulnerable to these changes but also how they can adapt. Despite the potential urgency of this issue, we have found surprisingly little information in the media and academia that brings attention to this issue. And this knowledge is essential for our understanding of how to prepare for climate change and ensure that the rights of Scottish citizens are compromised at no point because of it. So, in light of this, we have decided to set ourselves the challenge of utilising what we've learnt here at Glasgow to see exactly what risks Scotland and its future is at. And to do this, we're going to ask three questions. How will climate change impact Scotland? How vulnerable are Scotland's people and landscapes to this? And ultimately, what can we do to adapt to and mitigate the negative effects of climate change in the future? So, we'd like to invite you, through this film, to join us as we travel to all corners of Scotland to meet with government officials, industry specialists and local people to answer our questions. Before we got out into the field to start our investigations, we wanted to look at existing scientific studies of climate change and its impacts in Scotland, as well as what can be done to mitigate it. So today we're coming back to our department to document how much we know about climate change in Scotland so far. Scotland's climate has always been changing. We come from a thick, glaciated past which we can see in our rugged and hilly landscape to the temperate and characteristically wet climate we see today. Temperature rises in the past 30 years have spiked due to human greenhouse gas emissions resulting in the sharpest temperature increase Scotland has ever seen. This has both global and local impacts on our landscape. Temperature increases such as this can lead to all sorts of environmental issues, such as increased storminess, unpredictable weather all across the country and sea level rise. Erosion and weathering are processes that occur naturally along all landscapes, particularly at the coast. These impacts of climate change are predicted to enhance these natural processes. Given that Scotland's coastline is over 16,000 kilometres long, this leaves a lot of land vulnerable to coastline recession. We rely on these physical landscapes for food, livelihoods and for sheltered places to live, but this reliance also leaves us vulnerable to the negative impact of environmental change. Looking to maps of Scotland's coastline, you can clearly see the infrastructure that's at stake, local economies could be affected and people's basic human rights could be compromised. And flooding, an issue we are well versed with here in Scotland, could affect much more of our population in future. Now, even if the two degree limit of the Parish Climate Agreement is kept, global sea levels could still rise by up to six metres, and you can see the impact this would have. Here, the blue shading indicates areas that would be flooded with sea level rise. Low-lying residential areas and services such as Glasgow Airport would be inundated, and huge proportions of communities in places like the Western Isles could be lost. Through considering all of this, we hope to make a thorough assessment of how vulnerable Scotland and its people are to climate change. So our investigations begun, and the first issues we wanted to look at were flooding and sea level rise. With many of Scotland's major cities being situated in river catchments, and with 41% of the population living within 5 kilometres of the coast, it is clear that rising sea levels and increased flooding pose massive risks. We wanted to see how this risk is managed in both built up and in rural areas, so for our first stop we headed to the banks of the Clyde. As Scotland's biggest city, Glasgow is home to some of the country's most valuable pieces of infrastructure, and being built around the Clyde, it also has a high level of flood risk. Now how the local council here mitigates this flood risk will be a big indicator of how vulnerable the city is to the impacts of climate change here in future. To investigate this further, we've come to Glasgow Games Village, which is on the banks of the Clyde. This is a recent housing development for the 2014 Commonwealth Games. It has a built-in flood risk management system. And to find out more about this, we're going to speak to James Money, who is part of the Glasgow City Council Development and Regeneration Sector. So, of course, rivers pose a flood risk due to their variability, but what makes this site particularly vulnerable? Well, this site, uh, as you say, every river has got a level of flood risk and it just depends on the size of the storm that happens. Um, generally, people talk about, say, a 1 in 200 year event. Mm -hmm. Now, what that doesn't mean is that it's only going to happen once mm -hmm. every 200 years. It means that there's a, a probability of it happening 0.5% every year. Mm -hmm. This site had uh, some areas that were... Uh, predicted to be within the 200 year floodplain. Mm -hmm. So when development was being brought forward here, there was a need to provide what we call compensatory storage. So there's some of the, the, the flatter areas sitting lower than the, the properties there. 
that's areas to compensate, restore So if there is a, a 200 year event, mm -hmm. um, these areas will flood and not the properties. Mm -hmm. By about 2080, the, the uh, change in rainfall for the west coast of mm -hmm. Scotland is probably going to increase in total by about 20%. So what we okay. tend to do these days with projects is we, we design for a certain design level in terms of flood risk mm -hmm. plus climate change. So okay, at the yeah. moment we're using plus 20%. So given these risks, why do people still build on floodplains and how can they adapt? Well, particularly in the, the urban areas, um, there's, there's pressure to, to build more houses because we are short of homes yeah. in this country and across the UK. Uh, in terms of how that's then brought forward and mitigating against uh, flooding risks and climate change, well, we, we can provide sacrificial storage areas, we can raise areas of land but then have to provide other areas yeah. that, that can flood. Uh, and then we bring forward more sustainable methods of treating the, the surface water and the, the runoff, such as things like this, this pond that we've got here. I think one of the challenges we have in Scotland is that people are still a, a little bit blasé in terms of uh, climate change. Climate change is happening um, and will impact us, so we have to bring forward more mitigation and adaptation measures to help us uh, be resilient going forward in uh -huh. this, this country. In this city setting, it is clear that there's many opportunities to mitigate against flood risk, but the real challenge is implementing flood defences into existing urban areas. However, Scotland is a country of many diverse landscapes, so to understand how climate change is impacting the country as a whole, we are going to travel to South Uist, a remote island community, to look at how the same issue is being experienced there. So we set off north and the train took us far from Glasgow's urban sprawl and deep into the vast rugged landscapes of the Highlands. As we travelled, we could start to see the real diversity of Scotland's landscape and the different ways in which communities can face challenges. This became all the more evident when we boarded the Uist ferry and left the mainland altogether. Watching the coastline fade into the distance, we got a true sense of how remote the Outer Hebrides are and how far away they are from the discussions dictating adaptation and Scotland's future that take place in the central cities. By looking at South Uist on maps of Scotland, it's clear just how remote and exposed it really is. And standing here on the east coast of the island, the low-lying topography that we can see shows just how vulnerable it can be to a changing climate. In the large cities of central Scotland, there are high levels of infrastructure that can protect against sea level rise and coastal erosion. But out here, what will be really interesting to see is if the same opportunities exist and how able these communities are to adapt. To look at South Uist's adaptive capacity, I travel to meet Father Michael MacDonald, a parish priest whose knowledge of the island spans decades. How in South Uist here are people vulnerable to the physical impacts of climate change? The risks are particularly to agriculture, to the protected areas for birds. Um, there are also risks to the, the, the whole of the environment there. I, I have to stress it is a managed environment. Yeah. The, if the sea breaches, what we will have from one end to the other of South Uist is a salt marsh. Yeah. And on a salt marsh, nothing grows. Yeah. So all that will be destroyed. The, the people's lives will change. It will be the end of crofting on the west coast. Uh -huh. We have uh, areas of South Uist on the Macher there, uh -huh. which are, are two metres below sea level at High Spring. And uh, uh, if you were to go to Boysdale, which is not far from here, yeah. there is only just the tiniest little ridge yeah. preventing the sea from inundating that whole area. Wow. How positive do you feel about the future of South Uist in the face of climate change? I always feel positive about the future of South Uist. I think the, the ingenuity and resourcefulness of our own people here, we will survive. Uh -huh. However, uh, you know, I think we, we have a, a great opportunity to do something, not just for ourselves, but which could be an exemplar for the whole of Scotland. To understand how the physical and human environments interacted, I met with coastal management engineer David Muir, who took me on a walk along South Uist's west coast to see some of the most vulnerable points of the island. This area here where we're looking at, uh, where the crops are growing, almost all of it is below the high water, high water mark and mm -hmm. depends on drainage to, to keep the, the water off the surface of the land. Mm -hmm. What kind of mitigation strategies and adaptations do you think is possible for the community on Uist to do and how effective do you think these will be in the long term? These types of defences here are really sticking plasters on a long term problem and the, the community will have to, to change 
their, their way of thinking on how they're going to react to that in the long term. Yeah. Land itself is quite capable of adapting to the change that's taking place, but it's not the land that has to adapt so much as the people that have to adapt. So if climate change does worsen and this area becomes inundated, how do you think this will affect the cultural heritage here? Well, if, this, if we lose the, the, the agricultural practices that are carried out here, even though it's small-scale agriculture, like which crofting is, uh, the crofting is the, really the backbone, the mainstay of, of the, the culture of the islands, and especially the, the Gaelic culture, Gaelic language and Gaelic culture itself. Mm -hmm and it would be a huge loss to this, this area to, to see people disappear from these areas because of, of um, sea level rise and the salt water going across the land. Mm -hmm. The time we spent in South Uist made us realise that issues such as sea level rise that are predicted to impact central Scotland several years down the road are right on South Uist's doorstep and require immediate action. Through comparing flood risk in Glasgow and South Uist, it's clear that South Uist really has so much at stake and we need to remember to bring these outlying communities into all conversations about climate change in Scotland before it's too late. As we travelled back to the mainland for the next phase of our investigations, we decided to split up to each look at how climate change could impact parts of Scotland we have very personal connections to. For this, I hope to visit my hometown to look at the impacts there. But first, I travelled to one of Scotland's national nature reserves to look at how the landscapes I love to hike through could be at risk. I have memories going back to when I was a child of exploring the wilder parts of Scotland, so I want to investigate how these places could be impacted by climate change. To look at this, I've come to Flanders Moss National Nature Reserve. And it's areas like this that I love to come to, to explore the natural world, to see more of Scotland's beautiful landscapes, and above all, brave Scotland's wild and unpredictable weather. So this area here is one of Britain's biggest lowland peat bogs. And given that these environments make up 23% of Scotland's land area, the vulnerability that we see here will be a massive indicator for the country's welfare. So to look at this, I'm going to pay the reserve manager, David Pickett, a visit to discuss how climate change will affect national nature reserves such as this. So how vulnerable would you say the Flanders Moss peat bog nature reserve is to the impacts of climate change such as storminess, unpredictable weather and temperature rise? Um, it is vulnerable, yes. It, it's, a, it's a damaged bog already. It's degraded because of humans' ac activities on the moss um, uh, and all of that meant that it's dried out. But if you increase the temperature, that would then uh, increase the water loss from the site. If you have stormy events, that can cause erosion. So climate change is only going to exaggerate that damage that's already happened. It doesn't look good for the bogs. Without any intervention, they're going to be degrading. Um, we're doing a lot of um, restoration work, which will help to mitigate the effects of, of um, climate change. And what we can do is we can go over and have a look at them if you want. We'll head out over that way and uh, look at some of the work we've been doing. David took me to one of the deepest parts of the bog to explain how carbon in the atmosphere can be reabsorbed into the peat bog through a process called carbon sequestration. And on the way, I was astonished at just how much carbon the bog could hold. I mean, it's a huge blob of carbon here. What we've got, it stretches right the way over to the conifer trees over there, um, and a loop, big loop round to these birch trees here. So it's about 860 hectares in size. That's about 2,200 football pitches. So David, can you please explain what carbon sequestration is and how it's used here at Flanders Moss? Well, here at Flanders, this area here was about 30 years ago, it was cleared and ditched and dried out, ready to dig up the peat. Uh, and uh, the peat was then uh, exposed, it was oxidising, it was releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And if it had all been dug up, the metres of peat that we're standing on would have all gone into, um, into the atmosphere and contributed to climate change. What we've done is we've blocked up the ditches, and one of the ditches is here, and brought the water table back up to the surface. Uh, and in doing so, that stops the carbon, uh, the, the peat from oxidising, and uh, therefore we're locking up the carbon here. I mean, we've got a huge numbers of peatlands in Scotland, uh, and uh, a lot of those are in a degraded state. So it's really important for us to make sure that those are not putting carbon into the atmosphere, but in fact, would be if they're in a good state, they'll be taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. 
Although I've visited landscapes such as these since I was little, I've never fully been able to appreciate the vulnerability of these areas. And it worries me that younger generations may not be able to experience them in the way that our generation have. Despite this, it's reassuring to hear that we have the knowledge and access to mitigation strategies that can safeguard these landscapes from the risk of climate change. Whilst Jenny was looking at climate change's impact on the physical landscape, I wanted to look at how this might affect our industries and people's livelihoods here in Scotland. And I thought, what better way to do this than to travel back to the town that I grew up in? For me, this meant coming to St Andrews. This coastal city is where I spent most of my childhood. And for summer after summer, I'd come to this beach to build sand castles and go swimming. And just past the dunes over there is where I made my not so successful attempts to learn how to play golf. Now, after exploring Scotland over these last few weeks, looking at climate change, it's clear how vulnerable St Andrews could be. And experts predict that by 2050, this whole area here could be inundated by frequent storm surges. Now, golf is one of St Andrews' biggest assets. So today, I'm going to speak to Gordon Moyer, head of greenkeeping here at St Andrews Links, to learn just how vulnerable St Andrews is to this issue. What is currently being done on the golf course to protect it from coastal erosion and uh, storminess? And what current measures are in place? Well, for the last five or six years, we've, we've been working very hard with um, the local authority, Fife Council. Yeah. We've been working with Fife Coast and Countryside Trust to definitely try and improve the condition of the beach, because that dunes are the first line of defence from yeah. the sea. Um, I guess it's always been prone to surges. The only really big surge I can, uh, I can recall was back in 2010 in March. We had some water come up with Swilkin Barn and burst the banks of the barn and came onto the first green, first fairway and things like that. At the lower end of the course there were four or five holes affected. The seawall was actually burst or breached beyond the golf courses but the fields there are quite flat so the water came rushing up the fields. And some experts are predicting that climate change could cause these kind of areas to be covered in water and storms um, in the next 50 or so years. What can you do to adapt to that in this area? Well, I guess, I, I guess all we could maybe do is extend the height of the sea defences that are here already. At the moment, I would remain very positive. Um, you know, I, have, I haven't seen very much change in the 25 years that I've been here. At the moment, everything's looking very healthy, and I'm, I'm pretty sure we, you know, we, have, the, we have the budget, or uh, we were managed to find the budget to protect these courses for the people of the town and what they bring to the town. So how climate change impacts the beaches and the golf here will have huge impacts on the community's economy as a whole. To find out more about this, I'm going to speak to Ray Peed, who owns the Glendaren Guesthouse and is an active member of St Andrews' accommodation industry. The tourism industry in St Andrews is um, heavily reliant on the golf industry. This is, of course, the home of golf. And um, over the year, about 20-25% of visitors to St Andrews come for the golf. But any severe increase in, in sea levels would of course swamp the golf courses yeah. um, and that would be catastrophic really. So what do you see for the future of St Andrews given the risks posed by climate change? Well I feel very positive because St Andrews is a very forward thinking town, not just the golfers but also the, the, the businesses and the shops. Um, so I feel very positive that any climate change coming our way that we can take any appropriate action to, to minimise its impact on the town and its tourism industry. Today has been a very insightful day. Having spent 18 years living in St Andrews and the last four years learning about climate change through studying geography, I have never put them both together until now. And when you do, you see that places like St Andrews are incredibly vulnerable to the potential impacts of climate change. But having spoken to people in the town today, it's clear that people are ready to adapt and people know what they need to do to prepare for the issue in the future. So if more towns in Scotland can be like St Andrews, then I feel that the country's future is very hopeful and that we have everything we need to prepare for climate change as long as people can act and direct the investments to the right places just now. Through visiting these sites across Scotland, we've been able to build up a picture about how vulnerable Scotland really is to climate change and what can be done to mitigate against these negative impacts locally. To take this a step further, for the next stage of our investigation, we want to meet with industry specialists to ask what can be done to move forward as a country. We followed links with the government and community organisations to find the people working hardest to mitigate climate change in Scotland. We can do so much to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and that's going to continue to be really important, but unfortunately we have um, a certain amount of climate change that is coming our way as a result of our current and past emissions. So we need to face up to that and we need to take early action to adapt. 
I definitely feel that young people and people on the whole can have a really positive action in terms of climate change through their behaviours, through their actions, through the attitudes that they spread and, and the values that they have. Scotland's going to be very different 50 years from now and the rest of the world even more so. Obviously we're going to experience more heat waves. Uh, we're also going to experience more intense rainstorms which will lead to flooding, uh, not just of rivers but with rising sea levels also coastal areas. I think there are areas where we, we know less about at the moment as well. Um, so for example we don't know how frequency and severity of heat waves interact with our building stock and our populations to, to see whether there are particular areas where we may need to do something more. I think the coverage is patchy at the moment. Some cities and some regions and some local authorities are doing more than others. But I think if we do it on a regional basis and we all help each other plan together, not only will we get the cost benefits, but those who understand more and have more resources can help the others get up to speed as well. So that willingness to work in partnership is really, really important and is um, a key ingredient to ensuring that Scotland you know, does adapt and is resilient into the future. If people hear that you are concerned, if people hear that you care, if people hear that you've got ideas, then it shows and you can lead by example and it starts conversations and it gets people to understand why it's something we need to act on. We should all be positive about uh, planning ahead and doing what we can to address climate change. We have fantastic expertise here in Scotland. We have a government that's committed. We have local authorities that are committed. We can do this and we can create a better Scotland through doing it. Speaking to these industry specialists, it was inspiring to hear how positive the future could look for Scotland. However, for this to be the case, we've all got a big role to play now, both on individual and governmental levels. If we could put the work in now to prepare for and mitigate climate change but we still have time, one thing's for sure, and that is that we will leave a country for future generations that offers the same experiences and opportunities that we've been able to have throughout our lives. So now our investigation has come to an end and we thought we would come back to Glasgow where this all began several months ago to reflect on what we've learned. And we have learned so much. Looking to Scotland's cities, we can see that places like St Andrews in Glasgow are incredibly vulnerable to the potential impact of a changing climate and how this has knock-on effects on several different industries. But we've also seen how ready people are to adapt and how mitigation strategies can be successfully set up. And through spending time in the more remote parts of Scotland, such as South Uist and Flanders Moss, it's clear that our physical landscape is undergoing colossal change and that this change could threaten some of Scotland's fundamental culture and livelihoods. Looking to the future, it seems that right now we have an incredible opportunity to take action before large parts of Scotland are impacted irrecoverably, and who knows how long that will last. So if we can all individually seek out solutions and adapt to lower our carbon emissions, as well as to forge relationships between governments, industries and communities, we can set Scotland up for a future that we can be proud to hand down to the next generation. And whether or not we can make this future a reality all comes down to you. This might be the end of our part of the story, but the story of climate change in Scotland's future continues with everybody. So over the next few years, it's in all of our hands to do all that we can to make that future a positive one.